we have a simple question. Do you want your grandchildren to survive? I think the people you're talking to say, yes, I want my grandchildren to survive. So many people's grandchildren are already not surviving. That's, that's the issue. Yes. You want to ensure that they'll live underwater or have a chance to survive. So, so many people aren't thinking about living underwater because they're incarcerated or they're unhomed. Then as an activist, your goal is to make, get them to think about it because that is what is at stake. So that was a clip of the upcoming interview Virgil and I did with Professor Noam Chomsky. It was a wild ride. Uh, what did you think, Virgil? I think we won the debate. <laughs> I think we, pr we proved we're smarter than him. Stop. Look, well, we obviously really appreciated him taking the time, you know, a full hour almost to talk to us. And, you know, well, what else has he got to do? He's got tenure. <laughs> Well, look, you know, I think a lot of the left is very familiar with the fact that his advice that we should vote against Donald Trump and make sure that he is out of office, advice which he offered up pretty shortly after Bernie Sanders dropped out of the race, it was very controversial because at the time, I think a lot of leftists were still hoping to have some political leverage and to be able to condition their vote on something. So we had that conversation about whether or not it's appropriate to condition one's vote. And uh, we got a very clear answer from him. In response, it's worth noting that Noam Chomsky is an anarchist, and anarchism leads to crap like this. <laughs> Virgil, I'm sorry to any anarchists listening, but come on. No, I don't say Virgil because of that. I say it because you know, I don't want our guests to think that we're going to have them on and then like talk smack about them. <laughs> <And roast them. laughs> in the, in the intro, the reality is, like, I kind of like that. I kind of like that idea. We're like we're like a Joan and Melissa Rivers type thing. Like, ooh, when you come on, you're going to get. You're going to get roasted. You know, what are you wearing, Professor? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I'm no... Who's that sweater? I'm no, no academic. I'm obviously not Noam Chomsky. And you guys can all feel free to tear us into pieces and tell us how wrong we are after this. Virgil will still be in the posting section of the Patreon saying that he won the fight. Regardless. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, yeah, I won the fight. I know he was, he was completely misrepresenting my points. He was, you know, deflecting, just sort of repeating the same things. Like we, we clearly won the debate. I think a lot of the people who are swayed to vote for Biden after listening to Marianne are just now going to vote third party after hearing how badly Professor Chomsky did against the two of us. And also, you know, you say we're not academics, but we do host a podcast, which <laughs> honestly, academia is, uh, it's, it's, it's outmoded. Nobody, nobody needs it. Nobody cares about it. No, we're the ones. We're the ones generating the ideas that society uses, that activists put into into practice. You, me, and Joe Rogan, baby. Yep. <laughs> All right. Yep. Well, this is bad faith, and this is Noam Chomsky. We're joined now by linguist, philosopher, cognitive scientist, activist, and author of the forthcoming book, Climate Crisis and the Green New Deal, Professor Noam Chomsky. Professor, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to echo what Virgil's sentiments are. Your voice is so incredibly meaningful and persuasive as someone who is deeply respected, obviously, for both your scholarship and kind of your political opinions over the course of time. And so it made big news, understandably, uh, a few months ago when you came out very strongly advocating for leftists who at the time were many of whom were very frustrated by the way the primary season ended to uh, pledge their votes to to Joe Biden. No, I didn't say that. Okay, can you can you clarify then what it, what is your position? What I said is a thousand times as loud as possible you should vote against Trump. Now it happens that there's a technical fact which says when you want to vote against Trump you have to push a lever for Biden. But the left doesn't get involved in these games. The idea of uh, making elections the be all and end all of politics is the mainstream conservative idea. 
the idea is politics is supposed to be restricted to electoral extravaganzas. You show up every couple of years and push a lever, then you go home. The official doctrine, I've repeated it, quoted it from the main sources, is you're supposed to be spectators, not participants. Your job as a citizen is to show up every once in a while, pick one or another of the so-called responsible men, and then go home. The, to use the standard, the phrase of the main writers on the topic, or Lippmann in this case, the ignorant and meddlesome outsiders, the public have to be put in their place. They have a role to show up and vote now and then, period. Now the left has always taken a very different view. Uh, real politics consists of constant activism. Every once in a while, an event shows, comes up in which you have to take a couple of minutes to decide whether it's worth pushing a lever to keep out someone of who's truly dangerous. So you, if, in this case, the argument for that is simply overwhelming is the most dangerous figure ever to have appeared in political history. So yes, take a couple of minutes, vote against him, then uh, proceed back to real politics, which is the constant activism, which in fact has pushed Biden's program to the left of any of his predecessors. And if it continues, can go more. But the principle is vote against Trump, then challenge Biden. Well, I think the argument that's being made uh, by some on the left, including myself earlier in this election cycle, was that by withholding one's vote, by, by saying I'm not going to vote for Biden, uh, or as you say, against Trump unconditionally, you could continue to push Biden to the left at a time when he is most vulnerable because of his electoral position. So that endorsing him early on in the process or b endorsing him by virtue of saying you're going to vote against Trump, you know, no one's talking about third party votes as counting as against Trump, right? We're talking exclusively about votes for, for Biden. So I guess the question is why? Mm -hmm. no, let's, let's try to be serious about it. To say you have, there's an argument that says by joining the 50% of the population that doesn't vote, I'll somehow influence the Democratic Party. I think that's a pretty long shot. Yeah. There's another, yes, a very long shot. They don't pay attention to the 50% who don't vote. There's another proposal, which is say, keep the activism going, compel the program to move to the left, as was done, and then vote against Trump and vote and challenge Biden, keep pushing it to the left. These are two strategies, okay? But the, in neither case is it a matter of voting for Biden. It's a question of which strategy you use to push the party to the left. One is, I'll keep quiet. The other is, I'll get engaged the way the Sunrise Movement was, the way the Sanders campaign was and succeed in pushing the program considerably to the left. In fact, the actual program on crucial issues like say climate change, but despite the resistance from the DNC, turns out to certainly be better than any predecessor and not too bad and can be pushed farther. So those are two tactical choices about how to move the uh, program to the left. In my view, at least, the advantages of the tactical choice of constant activism are overwhelming. Uh, keeping quiet has no effect. Well, I think that I agree with that, absolutely. And that no one I know is really advocating to keep quiet. That it's a third tactical option that's being offered, which is to say, in the same way that voting blocks like unions have been able to coordinate masses of voters and deliver them to politicians in return for certain promises, that some portion of progressives, be they leftist, former Sanders supporters, young people, Black Lives Matter protesters, whatever collective group there is, could condition one's vote for Biden 
against Trump on Joe Biden delivering some goods the same way as the Sunrise Movement did. Now, let's take that position. Suppose you're one of these people. Do you intend to vote against Trump in November 3rd? Conditioned on whatever terms. Not conditioned. Suppose that your demands were not met. Would you vote against Trump? Then no. That's the, there's no persuasive value. There's no leverage if the vote is unconditional. You wouldn't vote against Trump. No, in this scenario, means, yeah. Right, which means you would help Trump win because not voting for one candidate not voting for Biden is equivalent to putting Trump one vote ahead. So your choice is, okay, if they don't do what I want, I'll essentially vote for Trump. I'll put Trump ahead. I don't think that's a wise decision. So the argument then is, if people are asking Joe Biden to do things that are electorally beneficial to him, if they're asking him to support policies like the Green New Deal that overwhelming majorities of Americans support, including a bipartisan, bipartisan majorities of Americans, and yet he still declines to adopt said policies. Yes, he moved somewhat on the Green New Deal. He went from a $1.7 trillion plan over 10 years to a $2 trillion plan over four years and that is meaningful. Of course, it pales in comparison to the level of investment that many climate scientists say is absolutely necessary for us to meet the UN IPCC goals to actually getting where we need to be in terms of um, degree Celsius change. All of this is common ground, but it's missing the point. Mm -hmm. The question is, what are you intending to do on November 3rd? If you say, and you mean what you're saying, if you don't... Mm -hmm vote, uh, put Medicare for all on your program, I'm going to give a vote to Trump. If that's what you mean, say it, okay? Mm -hmm. And then what you're saying is, if I don't get what I want, I'm going to help the worst possible candidate into office. I think that's crazy. Well, what is the consequence? What are the long-term consequences of everybody on the broad left, Democrats, liberals, everyone, saying that under any circumstances, we will vote for a Democratic candidate as long as they are incrementally better than the Republican candidate. Does that way of thinking contribute to the rightward shift of the Democratic Party over years? And what mechanism will ever stop that shift if we're not willing to ever, under any circumstances, leverage our votes? So what you're saying, if you think it through, is... We should help Trump win because maybe in the long run, that'll affect the Democratic Party. That's a terrible choice. Helping Trump win, as you're proposing, would mean four more years of destruction of the environment, getting possibly to tipping points, that which would be irreversible, certainly making any effort to deal with it very difficult. It would mean sacking the judiciary with young ultra-right lawyers, top to bottom, so that nothing would be possibly done for a generation, and I can go on and on. I don't think that's a wise choice, just on the hope yeah. that maybe sometime in the long term, the Democratic Party will pay attention to the fact that you're part of the 50% of non-voters. I think that's a very poor judgment. I take that very seriously. I take the multi-generational threat very seriously. You know, as a Black American whose family members have been living as a third tier in American society, my mother was born into an America that didn't recognize her basic human rights. Um, in 1960, she's a relatively young woman. And obviously the kinds of the, the world that my grandparents and great-grandparents had to live through was much more dramatically unequal than even that. And so what concerns me is the way in which the vote blue no matter who mindset basically privileges more recent concerns that are equally grave as more longstanding concerns that are built in the status quo and says, we have to vote for X candidate to prevent X ill from happening. At the same time, those who have suffered under the status quo never seem to get an opportunity to have their issues heard because a maintenance of the status quo is always a number one priority that will do anything to preserve. And I think that when you look at a lot of who is feeling disaffected right now, it is a lot of 
younger black voters who felt like there was an opportunity to pull the lever and do things the right way with Barack Obama, but who don't see any real change having materialized and that the status quo for them just simply isn't good enough. How do we change that? How do we keep that pattern from recurring so voters have some confidence that pulling the lever isn't just going to maintain the status quo, but do something more? So what you're proposing is, in order to get my voice heard, what I will do is help put into office a candidate who is dedicated to destroying the prospects for human life on Earth by racing towards environmental catastrophe, who is stacking the entire judiciary with young lawyers who for a generation will be able to block any progressive legislation, who will continue to uh, dismantle uh, the arms control regime, which is somewhat projecting, protecting us from nuclear war, uh, who will, I can go on and on. I will do that because that'll help me get my voice heard. No, I'm sorry, it won't. Professor, I, I wouldn't argue that I am putting, I am helping Trump. I would argue that if the Democratic Party, if Joe Biden as a candidate were unwilling to concede these very um, common sense concessions that would help him in electoral context and would also be the right thing to do, that it is he who would be enabling Trump and that framing the onus as decidedly on the voter instead of the politician who's in a position of power to actually affect the outcome is wrongly doing a kind of a kind of voter shaming that continues to have the effect of suppressing the vote among people who are, I think, very valiantly asking for a better world. And yes, using the vote, the only real tool they have to directly communicate with their elected officials to influence. Totally wrong. That's the establishment view and you shouldn't buy into it. The vote is not the only tool you have. Oh, well, one of the only. I didn't say exclusively. It's the least of the tools that you have. That's the establishment view. You're a spectator, not a participant. Do the vote, go home. The real politics is constantly working to change the conditions under which political figures will be compelled to shift their views. That's real politics. Every once in a while, an event comes up called an election. You have to make a, take 10 minutes to decide, am I gonna keep the worst guy off or is it not worth bothering? Often it's not worth bothering. Now this time it is very much worth bothering. And we have a choice. Will I take 10 minutes to get rid of a true monster who's gonna have devastating effects or will I not do it? because maybe someday that will help make my voice be heard under far worse circumstances. That's a simple choice. It's not a matter of just the vote. What you do if you're sensible is say, look, this guy is a major monster. We've got to get rid of him. I'll take five minutes to do it. Then I'll go back to the kind of real politics which changes consciousness, awareness, environment, uh, make, sets the conditions under which any political figure will have to react. That's left politics. None of this business about concentrating on the election the way the establishment wants you to do. And certainly if the choice now is between four more years of monstrous activities, which may actually destroy the prospects for human life on earth, and will certainly make doing anything we want far more difficult. The choice is either that or voting against the him and then going back to the activist work that changes conditions and will compel them to move towards more progressive ends. That's the choice. You don't concentrate on the vote. The vote is the least of politics. That's establishment propaganda. Professor, you mentioned earlier that activism has moved Biden to the left over the course of the general election campaign. That's curious to me because what I've seen is Biden resisting moving to the left. One famous note 
the out of the DNC Unity Commission, the Sanders Biden Unity Commission, one of the recommendations was postal banking, letting letting the post office operate as essentially a credit union. And uh, it was reported that Biden made a phone call to the banks and told them, don't worry about that. That's just something for the Warren people. We're not actually going to do that. So my question to you is, how has Biden been moved to the left? Well, very clearly. What you're saying is he didn't move as far as you wanted. True. He didn't move as far as I wanted. But take a look at the programs. So you look at the campaign, take, say, climate change, the most important thing. His program is way to the left of any previous one, certainly to the left of what the DNC wants, calling for uh, nowhere near far enough, but much farther to the left. I can quote it for you if you want, or you can look it up. Same on other issues. Not as far as I would like, but it has been moved. Same is true of everyone in the past. Uh, Lyndon Johnson didn't go as far as I would have liked on civil rights, but he went farther than anything in the past. Uh, Richard Nixon didn't go as far as I wanted on pr protecting workers' rights, but he went to the left under pressure. That's how politics works. Yes, it won't be as far as we like, therefore we keep working. Not, it didn't go as far as I like, therefore I'll vote, I'll support the worst guy. Remember, those are the choices. You have a choice of supporting Trump or voting against him. You don't have any other choice on November 3rd. Now, if you take a look at Biden's program, it actually moved enough to the left so that the DNC has been trying to cut it back. Good. Now let's push him farther to the left. That's what activists have been doing, and that's what they should continue doing. But we have a simple choice on November 3rd. Shall I take five minutes to vote against a major monster who will put us in hideous conditions, or shall I not take those five minutes and uh, help him win? That's the choice. Then you go back to real politics. Would you make the same argument if the nominee were Michael Bloomberg? Of course. He's nowhere near as hideous as Trump. I mean, take climate again, which is one of the major problems. A lot of things are wrong with Bloomberg, but his position on climate is infinitely better than Trump's. Trump, the parts of the left can't seem to understand. They're joining with the far right in denying the crisis of climate. Oh, there's plenty of other things, but let's just keep to that. Trump is alone in the world in pressing the accelerator towards disaster soon. That's a crucial issue. Do we want to support that or do we want to kick him out? That's only one issue. No matter how bad Bloomberg may be on other things, it doesn't weigh in the balance against this. On the other things in which he's bad, Trump is also worse, but that doesn't matter. Can you understand how if you are one of a member of the groups that are attacked by Donald Trump and Michael Bloomberg, if you are, let's say, a black person who has been the victim of Bloomberg's stop and frisk policies and bear direct witness to his lack of respect for basic civil rights, Fourth Amendment rights, um, some of the most foundational rights we have as Americans, that being told that Donald Trump is incrementally worse than him speaks to a bigger systemic issue. Not mentally, vastly worse. Well, if we're talking about something like stop and frisk, it's a real potato potato situation with the two of them, given exactly how oppressive Bloomberg's reign in New York City was. So if you take an issue like that, I would argue that climate is a similar issue, especially given that the way climate change operates, even if you are significantly better than another person on climate, if you aren't structuring your climate program so that it prevents us from reaching the two degree, the 1.5 and then the two degrees Celsius temperature raise at which there are cataclysmic waterfall effects throughout the climate, then your good effort doesn't help us very much. You're, you're trying harder that doesn't get us to the place we need to be, still results in catastrophic climate 
change, right? Climate failure, environmental failures, right? So the question is, why are we constantly in a scenario where we're being asked to choose between two options, neither of which really get us where we need to go when overwhelming majorities of Americans actually support a full-throated Green New Deal program, the likes of which more progressive candidates were supporting in the race? You're asking, why do we live in a capitalist society that we have not been able to overthrow? Well, not necessarily. I think my question is a little bit narrower than that. But that is not the question that arises on November 3rd. On the question of housing discrimination, they're both Bloomberg and Trump are both bad. Trump happens to be worse, but it doesn't matter because the issue on November 3rd, even if it was Bloomberg, is not housing. It's shall organized human society survive? There's a big difference between one degree centigrade and four degrees centigrade, which Trump is driving for. Yes, he is. We have the documents for it. That means cataclysm. Okay, total cataclysm. All these other issues don't arise. So the and that's only one point. So the question is on November third, do I take ten minutes to stop? a monster who's trying to destroy us and then go back to work to try to change the society? Or do I help the monster? That's the choice. Well, my question was less about what to do on November 3rd. And I think I'd like to back away from the actual voting choice a minute, because I think it's obscuring a more substantive conversation that's really uh, where the meat is here on the left. I think that most leftists, most progressives, most Bernie supporters are going to vote for Joe Biden. The question is how it is constantly the case that we live in a country, regardless of socialism as an ideology, we live in a country where millions of people who do not identify as socialists support Medicare for all. 88% of Democrats do, uh, a slim majority of Republicans do, according to some recent polls. Overwhelming majorities of both parties support the Green New Deal in climate reform. Overwhelming majority support legalizing marijuana. We are in the middle of the largest, by numbers, the largest period of civil unrest, the largest protest movement in American history, which is making a very clear call for police reform. And in the middle of all of that, in the middle of the overwhelming polls in favor of progressive programs, and in the middle of enormous real politic pressure from the base of the Democratic Party, Joe Biden and the Democrats have not just said, no, we're not going to move on police reform. They have, in many instances, pandered to right-wing philosophies and said, as Joe Biden did recently, but the police need more money. We need to fund them even more. And said, I don't support the Green New Deal. I support my New Deal. And to have continued to punch at the left, and I think in, on the whole, start to undermine the gains that the left has made in the last four years or so. So what is our obligation to kind of stay silent as that constant assault on the leftist movement continues from the top of our party? What is our obligation to stay silent and perhaps make our own movement more vulnerable in order to get Joe Biden elected? We agree perfectly on the fact the left agrees, should agree. We continue with the activism. Of course, we try to change the society, the institutions, the government, the uh, all the oppressive institutions. We keep working on trying to change them and to change people's understanding and willingness to, uh, to act to change them. That's fixed. There's another question. Do we take 10 minutes on November 3rd to make our task infinitely harder Oh, do we take those 10 minutes to say, we'll get rid of what will make it infinitely harder, and then we'll keep working. That's all. Unless you accept the establishment position that voting is the be all and end all of politics. I don't think anyone here believes that, but the concern is that despite this enormous amount of pressure that's been put on by activists in the street as a part of these Black Lives Matter protests over the summer, the environmental protests with the climate change movement, et cetera, et cetera, that Joe Biden 
still hasn't moved. And I don't want to center it exclusively on him. Obviously, he is the figurehead right now. He has said, I am the Democratic Party recently, right? So therefore, you don't vote for him and go home. No, no, no. I'm not talking about voting. I this This voting aside, what confidence should we have that Joe Biden can be pushed if in the midst of all of this enormous pressure he's under, at the same time he is electorally vo- vulnerable and should be seeking our votes? He is still ignoring the calls from the ground, from the people. So I hear you say we can push him when he's in office and that that work has to continue. And I see that. I I appreciate that argument. But I'm wondering what what indication there is of that strategy being effective, given that we're seeing him show such disrespect to the left and such a blasé lack of concern for whether or not they will vote for him, whether or not they will support him, whether or not, you know, the fact that they are lying down in the street and risking their lives in protest. Um, if he is so indifferent at this moment, what hope is there that down the road that he will be more receptive to these goals? Let's distinguish two totally different questions. One is what can be done to change the way governments act? That's one question. We could talk about that. There are a lot of things that have been done. A lot of things have been done. There's a lot of progress. We could talk about that. But there's a second question. On November 3rd, we have a decision which will take 10 minutes. Do we help make the situation much harder for us to do what we want? Or do we get rid of the impediments to doing what we want and then do the best we can? That's the choice. It's a 10 minute choice for the left the traditional left, not the contemporary left, which seems to be caught up in the establishment propaganda, but for the traditional left, your activism continues. The questions you're raising are the right ones. Keep at them all the time. You take off a few, you decide whether it's worth taking off a few minutes to prevent uh, the, to prevent the making our task incomparably harder? And the answer to that is yes. Take off 10 minutes, prevent us from getting incomparably harder, then get back to work. You recently said that we should recognize that if global warming is an automatic consequence of capitalism, we might as well say goodbye to each other. Correct. If one believes, as I believe, that Biden is and running to be, as his, he has been his entire career a steward of capital, then how does one engage in activism that extracts meaningful concessions from a Biden administration without confronting capital? But you didn't understand the comment that I made. If we assume that capitalism is and it, it is unmodifiable to be uh, the, uh, and the institutions of capitalism of profit making, ignoring everything else, if we assume that that's unchangeable, we can say goodbye to each other. But we don't assume that. We don't have capitalism. We have a variety of state capitalism, which can take many different forms. And we can move it to the kinds of forms which will accommodate the crisis. It happens that there are very practical and effective ways within the general framework of existing institutions to take actions which will prevent the disaster that people who are helping Trump win are bringing about. Those moves do not change the capital, the fundamental capitalist institutions. The work contract remains, the bosses remain and so on, but they get us over this crisis. Then we can go to work to change the institutions. The alternative is to say, okay, let's give up, it's hopeless. No, I don't think it's hopeless. I don't want to say goodbye to everybody. And I don't want to go to the voting booth or to take on November 3rd to say, I'm not getting everything I want. Therefore, I'm going to help support the worst. That's the choice. You don't have a different choice. You can either try to block the worst or you can help support it. And the question is whether you should take 10 minutes to make that choice. The answer seems to me transparent. Then you go back to work and you talk about all the problems you've just been discussing about what are the best strategies to change the conditions 
under which whoever is in office will have to do this and that. And let's similarly move on to change the fundamental capitalist institutions, go on with that, set up uh, worker controlled industries, uh, eliminate the work contract, uh, throw out the financial institutions, ton of things we can do. Question is, do we want to make it harder for ourselves, maybe impossible for ourselves, or do we want to leave the opportunity open? Answer, we want to leave the opportunity open. We don't want to decide, let's make it impossible for ourselves. If these institutions, if these capitalist institutions result in recurring ecological crises and existential ones as they do, then isn't the real fight against those institutions instead of a reform that maybe gets us over the hump in 30 years, if it were possible to lobby those in power through activism, some kind of brokering, uh, those who are beholden to the profit motive, even if it destroys the environment? Think, think for a second. Think about time scales. We have maybe a decade or two to deal with the environmental crisis. Is there the remotest chance that within a decade or two we'll overthrow capitalism? It's not even a dream. Okay. So the question, well, the point that you're raising is basically irrelevant. Of course, let's work to try to overthrow capitalism. It's not going to happen like that. There's a lot of work involved. Meanwhile, we have an imminent question. Are we going to preserve the possibility for organized human society to survive? Are we going to preserve the possibility for us to work to overthrow capitalist institutions? Or are we going to say, it's hopeless, let's quit. I prefer the first. You're calling for the second. I want to really drill down on this and be really clear because let's say for the sake of this argument, not needing to disclose anybody's voting choices here, that we're all going to vote for Joe Biden against Donald Trump. But there are many people for whom this argument is not persuasive because it feels to them like they are being shamed. Oh, the environment is going to be ruined if we don't vote for Biden. And you, you couldn't, you, you have to care about these things. If you don't care about things, it's deeply irresponsible, et cetera. And I take that argument. But the reality is that for millions of Americans, their existential experience is that they are already living on the edge, that they have been lied to and misled by so many politicians for so long and their own personal material conditions are so bad that they are basically saying, throw me a lifeline. Throw me the bare minimum and I will vote for you and it will enable you to do everything you want in terms of environmental reform. All you have to do is throw me the tiniest of bones. My life is on the line. All I need you to do is save my life and I will vote for you. And the Democratic Party and Joe Biden is saying, no, you have to vote for me because of the environment. I reject your individual material personal concerns. I don't see how you can tell someone like that, that even if there is the, are these bigger concerns that they should abstractly be invested in, that they should put those things before their immediate material circumstances, even if, of course, poor, working class, people of color, et cetera, are disproportionately affected by the climate crisis. So as a strategic question, why is it that Joe Biden and Democrats more broadly are rejecting these programs and what does that mean for our ability to actually affect change down the line without doing something that's more radical and and perhaps and and, and and valuing our votes enough to arguably withhold them at some point under some conditions well the answer to that is to drop the establishment view which you're adopting and to return to the traditional left yes there's all kinds of institutions that are rotten. We want to change them. We're going to work on them. The vote is a small part of that, very small part, sometimes a major part, because the choice that you're making about throw me a lifeline or uh, I'm not going to vote, that's not the choice. The choice on November 3rd is do we take a few minutes away from the activism that is working on throwing a lifeline? Do we take 10 minutes off to eliminate a major 
huge impediment to this? Or do we say, I'm going to help the impediment be established? That's choice. The, the choice that millions of working people are making is not whether to take 10 minutes and vote. It's whether they're going to stand in a long line, risk COVID, take time off of work, where they're going to be you know, negatively impacted professionally for doing so. And also, these are people who are being asked to do that and take, make personal sacrifices to vote without getting anything personally in terms of their, their personal needs in return. Is that the choice on November 3rd? This is a choice for millions of Americans. It, it is. Is it the choice? Think for a second. Is it the choice for you? Well, no, but, but we're not talking about me. Is it the choice for the poorest person in the United States? Absolutely. Absolutely. Sorry, that choice is not arising on November 3rd. We live in this world, not some world we'd like to imagine. In this world, the choice on November 3rd is do we support someone who is a major threat to our existence or do we throw him out and continue to work on the things that we want to achieve? That is the choice, a 10 minute choice. None of the things that you're raising even arise. They don't arise then. Well, let's, let's talk about what this world, this world that existed in, in 2016, where in a state like Wisconsin, for instance, where Hillary lost by only about, you know, 20 odd thousand votes, there were 88,000 black Americans who voted in 2012 who declined to vote in 2016. This is in a state which has been economically disadvantaged by trade deals for all the reasons that everyone on this call understands. And when polled as to why they didn't vote, a very small percentage, about 4%, said voter disenfranchisement. The bulk of those voters, about 60%, said that they didn't think it would make a difference in the world. Now, you and I, because of the reasons you've articulated very well about climate, et cetera, understand that there are meaningful differences. Climate is the main thing, but there's thousands. The climate is the main thing, but the foreign, your foreign policy points are well taken. And How about stacking the judiciary? in a way in which nothing will ever happen. All those points are well taken, but to these voters, whether or not it's true, their perception because of their lived experiences is that they're not getting enough change in their, in their lived personal life. So therefore, as an activist, you have a simple test. Try to get people to understand that that is not the question that is arising. The question that is arising, which should take you 10 minutes for an activist is, shall I get rid of, shall I help get rid of a huge impediment, which may indeed make everything I hope for impossible, or shall I uh, try to, prov uh, shall I help that impediment remain? That's the choice, nothing else. And you have to get people, as an activist, you should be getting people to understand that. These other questions are important, but they are not arising in those five minutes in which you have to make that decision. What if by helping Biden to win, getting Trump out of office, I am, we are all basically ensuring four to eight years of the kind of incrementalist status quo democratic leadership that continues to cause more voters to be disaffected, fewer voters to want to vote at all, much less as Democrats. And then four to eight years from now, we're presented with a Tom Cotton presidency or the presidency of someone who's even worse than Trump. Can't you understand that this question is not arising? The question is, that is arising, are we going to get rid of a huge impediment to survival or are we going to help install that impediment? That's the question that's arising. Yes, we will have a candidate we don't like, we'll therefore move to challenge him in the traditional way as the left always done. But that's not the choice that's arising. The choice that's arising is, do I take 10 minutes to eliminate an impediment that will make all my hopes impossible? Or do I help establish that impediment? That's the choice that's arising it should take 10 minutes, if even that, to make the decision. Now, if people don't understand that, it is your task as an activist to help them understand it. The other questions you're talking about simply don't arise on in those 10 minutes. We keep working on them. Yes, 
But that's not what's arising in those 10 minutes. It's very simple. One of the central claims in your book is that it would cost less to take care of climate change uh, than was spent on World War II. I believe your co-author, Mr. Pollan, cites a figure about $18 trillion over 20 years to convert to a, a you know, fully carbon neutral economy. And that is, uh, I think there's no coincidence that that was the about the amount that Bernie Sanders proposed for his Green New Deal. Uh, Joe Biden has proposed $2 trillion over the next four years. The last time the Democrats were in power, 2009 to 2011, the biggest ticket item that they could pass in the middle of the greatest you know, economic crisis since the Great Depression was a stimulus package that was less than $800 billion. Out of the laundry list of things that Joe Biden has proposed, many of them very, very expensive, why should we believe that he will spend $2 trillion over the next four years effectively? You should believe it. You should not believe it. That's why if you join the left, you'll continue to work to make it go beyond. But the choice that we face on November 3rd on this issue is shall we vote for or against a candidate who wants to do nothing except race to the abyss. That's the choice, okay? If we manage to get rid of him, we move to the next task of pressing the Democratic candidate to go beyond the most progressive program that has yet been presented and to move on to the kind that we want. But, that, but what you're talking about just doesn't arise. The question that's arising is, do we help Trump get elected and run race to the abyss, or do we get rid of him and then go back to work? That's the choice. Other questions arise, but that's not the choice that arises in those 10 minutes. Very straightforward. The fact of the matter is that what Pollan suggests is two to 3% of GDP which turns out to be less than the uh, what the Treasury has poured in to save Wall Street in the last uh, in the last binge of uh, dealing with the economic crisis. It's well within reach. With continued activism, it can be done. But the choice that we're faced on November third is whether to make it impossible or to let it be possible. And if you think through what you're suggesting. You're saying, let's make it be impossible by keeping in the, the power that is never going to listen to anything we say, and it's going to race to the abyss. That's, if you want to do that, say it straight out, but not don't, don't go around it somehow. You and I agree on Trump, but why okay. should we That's believe? That's the only issue. That's the only issue. Let's get rid of him and then get to work. Sure, but we are looking. We are looking at a wider window here, and why should we believe that Biden is susceptible to activism? Either he is or he isn't. If he isn't, we're lost. If he is, we have a chance. With Trump, it is hopeless. Okay, not only hopeless, but it's a race to disaster. So the choice is: shall we race to disaster, or shall we try to prevent the race to disaster and do what we can to move? The, them uh, to the left. That's the only choice that's arising. There isn't another choice. I understand that the way you framed it is seems very straightforward, but I would offer that for millions of Americans, including you know 40% of the country who are non-voters, they don't see it that way. And perhaps they're irrational and obviously would disagree with them, and perhaps they're wrong. But the reality is that activists, I am not an activist. I don't I don't claim that mantle. You're very uh, as active. Much as I have, I have respect for them. But activists are in a tough spot because if you cannot, I, I would argue that if you cannot offer something that's a lot closer to an individual's life experiences and demonstrate how their lives will fundamentally improve, they have 
they don't feel like they have the incentive that you would like to think that uh, the environment is to go to the ballot box. And so it becomes an electoral question. It becomes a persuasive question. It becomes a question of how much we actually want to enable activists to do their job, to seriously consider how much leverage we have as people with platforms to influence what the Democratic Party offers and what activists can then take to the people. And I can't help but think that at this moment where we have the most leverage, because ultimately Joe Biden needs our votes to win, that it is incumbent on him to do the most he can do to make his platform most appealing to the most voters, the most voters, especially those voters who are the most marginalized and disaffected and who the Democratic Party holds itself out as representing. Look, what you're saying is I would like him to do different things. Right. And that we have power to influence that more now than at any other time. I would also like him to do different things. And the way to do that is continued activism. Now, as an activist approaching the people you're talking about, you should point out that they should free themselves from the establishment doctrine that what matters in politics is what you do every four years. No, it's not. What matters in politics is the constant activism that changes things, that changes consciousness, that led to the change of consciousness that permitted the Black Lives Matter protests after Floyd. A lot of work went into that. That's politics. Now we have a simple question. Do you want your grandchildren to survive? I think the people you're talking to say, yes, I want my grandchildren to survive. So many people's grandchildren are already not surviving. That's, that's the issue. Yes, and you want to ensure that they'll live underwater? or have a chance to survive. So so many people aren't thinking about living underwater because they're incarcerated or they're unhomed. Then as an activist, your goal is to make get them to think about it because that is what is at stake. What is at stake is, to, is precisely that. And if you can't do it as an activist, too bad, that's your job. Your job is to say, politics is not pushing a lever every four years, it is, engaging in the constant activism which will change things as it's done in the past doesn't happen in an instant have to keep at it now we have a simple decision are we going to make it impossible to achieve what we want are we going to work to ensure that your grandchildren will not be able to survive or do we want to take the opportunities that exist and try to make things better it's a very simple choice. And as an activist, that's what you bring to people. We really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. You've given our listeners a lot to think about, Professor. Okay, Virgil, that I will confess isn't exactly how I anticipated that conversation going. I think on some level, you know, you know me, I'm not someone who's who's ever said don't vote for Joe Biden, nor am I someone who I think can be characterized as indifferent to the very real world consequences that a Donald Trump president would bring. Mm -hmm. What I'm asking, what, what I was trying to get across is whether or not vote blue no matter who ism, whether the knowledge that the Democratic Party has that no matter what, it can coerce and shame its voters to doing the right thing and vote for the lesser of two evils, makes it so that every single year we get a more evil Democratic candidate. And my question is, okay, Donald Trump, let's say he's the worst president ever, but what if he replaced him with Bush, replaced him with you know, Bush one, let's replace him with Reagan, replace him with whoever you want, who arguably I, you could go fact by fact and say that they were just as bad or worse than, very, than Trump in various respect. But let's just pretend that Trump is somehow unique here among Republicans. If it were any of them, my concern is that they'd be making the exact same argument. So what is to stop us from ratcheting the entire country right and right and right? Because the left will never take a stand. And the way that right wingers, the way that Tea Partiers will draw a line in the sand and say, no more. You have to offer us a candidate that actually meets our needs. 
Well, Bree, that's not the consideration. The consideration <laughs> is spending 10 minutes on November 3rd to vote for Joe Biden. Virgil. Virgil. I know you're making a joke, but like, I also like, that's an important, but like, I, I was, I was frustrated. I was admittedly frustrated that he wouldn't even seem to acknowledge that voting does not take 10 minutes, that voting is an, as famously an onerous process, particularly for historically disenfranchised oh, yeah. people. Especially right now. Right. Yeah. It's, it, we're in the middle of a global pandemic and this idea that people are cavalierly voting. Heck, I'm like twisted in knots trying to figure out how to get my absentee ballot because I'm not sure if I'm, I'm like trying to move back to New York this month and like what state am I going to be in and yada, yada, yada. Like, you know, obviously I respect Noam Chomsky deeply, and I really appreciate him taking the time with us, but it is frustrating that at no level can I seem to find someone who's seriously willing to engage with the question. I, I will vote for Biden if you can explain to me, I mean, like, hypothetically, I'm just like put, putting this, framing it this way. If you can explain to me and guarantee me that we are not going to be in this exact same position or worse four or eight years from now and nobody this, this, this idea that we're going to activist our way out of this deeply entrenched two-party duopoly when we are at the peak of american activism and joe biden doesn't give a damn is 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 it's crazy making to me well Bree, do you want me to find you someone to to engage in this <laughs> argument with you i could do that could be your christmas present it's like I want someone who disagrees with me, right? Like, I want someone to say, I think we should vote for Biden for these reasons. And look, I, I, we just had this conversation with Marianne Williamson. And even though I don't, you know, fully agree with her on every point, I respect her position. She's not, I understood her position to be like, yes, Trump is uniquely bad, but I swear I'm not doing this again. You know, like next time yeah. around, we're going to have, we're going to take this third party stuff, the people's party seriously. We're going to, you know, but that didn't feel to me to be what Professor Chomsky was really saying here. And it felt like he wasn't really acknowledging the extent to which our voting behavior, even if it's not the be all end all of politics, I was a little bit of a straw man that I was frustrated with. No one here is arguing that voting is the be all end of all of politics, but to ignore that it is an extremely powerful tool in our arsenal to me seems deeply myopic. If it didn't matter, why would why would we do it? Right, right. I I wanted to I wanted to ask him why he's mad at Zizek. <laughs> I'm mad. That, I'm upset we didn't get a, a chance to, uh, you know, like prod that beef. Well, I'm I apologize for that. I know that I was like That's a dog fine. with the bone, but it's fine. But I mean, that'd be a good way. I mean, we could just tell people this will this will be a premium episode. We could just tell people that you know, oh, Chomsky was talking shit about Zizek. It was he was going <laughs> off right there. He was saying Zizek wouldn't take the ten minutes to vote for Joe Biden, even though the plan is at stake. And that's a good way we could get Zizek on. And maybe he'll argue. With I you. confess not to be. I mean, this is part of our charm, right? That I'm not as deep in the lefty public figure realm as you are. So I don't know anything about Zizek other, other than that there was that like debate a oh, year or so great. ago and everybody was talking about it. He's great. And I he's read Nathan Robinson's write up on the thing and that's about as deep as I got. <laughs> nah, nah, don't read that. Just read anything he wrote or watch any video of him. He'll come on and he'll talk to us about movies. It's great. He'll just explain. He'll just describe the plots of movies that he's seen and then he'll leave. Maybe we should have asked Professor Chomsky, some of those kinds of lighthearted questions. I'd like to know what he watches on a Saturday night. I don't want to beat a dead horse too much, but I will say that in preparation for this interview, I, I, I reread, you know, the article that I wrote about litmus tests that was basically laying out this argument uh, in defense of litmus tests and current affairs in July. And I was thinking about developing some of those those thoughts in light of how dismissive Joe Biden has been recently of the left broadly. And lit litmus test yeah so this idea that is there any low point for democrats like how chomsky said he would oh, vote for like how, for, for bloomberg, bloomberg. Like, yeah how far how, to the right you right to like go. under this logic if there's a donald trump who is just as horrible in every single way but would commit 1.7 trillion dollars over 10 years to climate reform then we should all vote for him and ignore kids in cages and hysterectomies and everything else yeah. that's leveraged like as, if like if josh holly were running and yes. he were Trump's opponent, yes. and he said, but he, well, Josh Hawley said he'll spend $2 trillion on climate change, so gotta vote We've for gotta him. We gotta vote for him. That's the, that's the existential issue. And what does that mean for you if you are one of the people who's being directly affected by some of the horrors that these politicians are inflicting on people? This is the, the one, like, probably the most significant change that's happened since I wrote the article, which is that it doesn't feel anymore that Biden is running 
indifferent to whether the left votes for him. It's starting to feel like he's running at the expense of the left so that the left is being attacked. Our ideology is being watered down. He keeps talking about healthcare as a human right when everyone knows that he doesn't support. Well, the problem is everyone doesn't know. People people believe that he believes healthcare is a human right because he says it, but it's diluting the message in the same way that Medicare for all who wants it was intending to dilute the message. And at some point, his victories start to come at the expense of the left's ability to advance its own interests. And what is our obligation to stay silent? I agree. Let's call it truth. Let's stay out of it. I won't say anything until he wins but if he keeps attacking all of the foundations that we 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 fought for and won over the last four years in terms of this, these ideological battles he's setting the clock back in a way that is arguably i'm not gonna say d- just as dangerous as trump but is also very dangerous in a way that shouldn't be ignored and how much are we saying that he's willing to take from us before we raise a hand and say okay dude like i don't want you not to win but like leave us the hell alone yeah Absolutely. Absolutely. Like you can't win on your own terms. If you're if you're a moderate and America loves moderates and that's why you're you're the, the one who should be president right now. Or you should be the candidate right now. Why do you feel the need to appropriate left language? If you're so if you're so invulnerable from attacks about being a socialist and that's why Bernie Sanders shouldn't be you know, the nominee, why is it that you can't answer a simple question at a town hall about whether or not you're a socialist without undermining a cons- the considerable percentage of your party, the majority of people under 30 who think that socialism is better than capitalism? I beat the socialists. That's how I got elected. That's how I got the nomination. Do I look like a socialist? Look at my career, my whole career. I am not a socialist. Why can't you fix your words and advocate for yourself without tearing down people around you who you're also counting on to vote for you. And if you honestly think that you can win without the left votes, why are we under all of this constant pressure to fall in line? It seems like they're trying to have their cake and eat it too. Absolutely, especially uh, it's especially grotesque when you have Bernie Sanders flying across the country to campaign for Joe Biden. Yeah putting himself at grave personal risk when none of the other people in that t-shirt <laughs> Beto and Kamala and blah, 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 that t-shirt none of the rest of them are putting their lives on the line even though they're not 78 year old men yeah Mike what's Mike up to <laughs> yeah what's Mike up to anyway look people are going to be upset about this and I don't want anything to be misconstrued what about this episode yeah, I mean, like my even this this little rant in which people are going to take as oh, Bernie's national press secretary is telling people not to vote for Joe Biden. No, all I'm saying is that I think it's irresponsible of us not to want to protect our interests somewhat. I was, we're supposed to just take this beating. Like the left believes in things that has its own program. It's fighting for them. It's fighting for things that are widely believed among most Americans and that are fundamental rights and interests. And I think it is perverse. I'm sorry, it's perverse to say you're not allowed to speak up when the, the the party that's supposed to represent you is trotting of those interests. Biden is this close to saying Black Lives Matter is hurting my election chances. Michelle Obama released a video today that trended on Twitter in which she basically spends five minutes, five entire minutes, yes, I watched the whole thing, five minutes basically saying that our ancestors fought and died for our votes, voting is so important, protesting is great, our ancestors protested for our rights, but protest voting is wrong. We cannot afford to withhold our votes or waste them on a protest candidate. One of these two men will be president. And only if we vote for Joe Biden with power and with passion, will our voices even have a chance at being heard. Protest voting is throwing away your vote. And I'm really tired. And this goes back to the Marion Williamson conversation. I'm really tired of being forced to make decisions that are completely separate and apart from our ethical, immoral, personal considerations. And I'm also, can I say, really kind of offended by the idea that I'm supposed to go to my working class family members in Cleveland, Ohio and say, hey, I know you've been working at a $7 minimum wage and you're a 68 year old woman who's bagging groceries in a safe way, but you should really, really take time off in the freezing cold Ohio winter and go and vote for Joe Biden because, you know, an academic somewhere told you that climate change, which you're never going to see 
see because the average black person only lives to like 65 anyway. So even black kids aren't, my grandkids, I, I won't even have grandkids. I'm probably not even going to have children <laughs> because my, I'm recording this from my studio apartment and my economic circumstances are such that even as relatively privileged as I am, it just doesn't seem to, to hash it out right. And so you're going to ignore all of these material concerns and say, well, the environment is the be all end all. The Supreme Court is the be all end all. Half these people don't have the right to choose as is under the status quo. Half the people, well, the idea that Brown v. Board saved the schools are se as segregated today as they were in the 1960s. And I just, I really resist the framing that things are so great now. Everyone has turned into Steven Pinker all of a sudden. I, I don't understand how you could divorce this complex, systemic, existential problem from people's immediate material concerns right. and say, yeah, I know you, I know you're experiencing racism. I know you're, you're out of a job and you lost your unemployment benefits, but Hey, this is really important. This is going to kill everyone. Yeah. Like if, if things are going badly for you, I, I, you might as well think, oh, fuck it. Who cares? It tacitly is saying you think that those people are callous and indifferent or stupid. People know that the environment is important, but here, here's the analogy I wanted to say, but I didn't know how to make it like not sound awkward. So I'm going to just try it with you. It's like knowing that you, you support a sports team, you support no, whatever the Lakers and I support the Pistons. Right. And the heat. Well, I have for reasons, longstanding affinity for well, the Pistons. Playing, Let me play, have they're, they're playing in the, finals, okay. Right I support now. the heat. So it's, and yeah, it's current. Are your if, That's called a if the hook. Lakers win, you win. <laughs> nice, yeah. nice. You're a professional. <laughs> <laughs> if the Lakers win, you get to survive. If the Heat wins, I get to survive. Otherwise, we're sum summarily executed. Okay? okay. We're each obviously rooting for our team to win. But if my team, which is obviously superior, I don't know who's better. This, I wanted a more of a, a, an imbalance in terms of skill so that this this analogy worked better. But the Lakers, the Lakers are better. Okay. The Lakers, the Lakers are going to win. Edit this out if the Lakers lose by the time this episode comes out. <laughs> but if your team very obviously inflicts self-harm, takes benches its two or three best players, and then says, hey, root for me anyway. <laughs> like, root for me anyway. And if, and if you don't root for me, it's because cause you secretly wanted me to fail. Okay, so like the Lakers, the Lakers make the finals and say, we're benching LeBron every single game. Yes. Oh, he's for the, Just, he plays for the Lakers, yeah, place the Lakers. That's rough. Well, I'm glad I didn't make myself the Cavaliers. Look, the point of the matter is, it's like, why is the onus on me as the as the fan when all the power and control is on Lakers management to make sure they have a winning team? Why is the onus? Why isn't? Why aren't more people asking? Why is Joe Biden undermining his own chances at victory? Why isn't he doing more to put together a winning coalition? Why is the only response from our former first lady, who I have an, a good deal of respect and admiration for, residual respect and admiration, why isn't the conversation at very least about what Joe Biden does in fact offer? Because there are some things that he's got that are good. But the conversation isn't even about, hey, Americans, I'm going to double the minimum wage. Hey, Americans, I have some progress on environmental reforms. Hey, Americans, here are these labor protections. Here are stuff that actually matters to you. No, all we get is a five minute track, literally five solid minutes of you must not understand the severity of what America is like if you're not going to vote for Biden. Well, honey, everyone. I think that a lot of the people who aren't voting understand too well the severity of what America is like. And they're trying to tell you that you got to do better than the malarkey that you've been shoveling toward them <laughs> you know, for generations, for generations since the third, this is you are, you are living in the consequences of third wave triangulation. And at a certain point, it's going to stop working and it's not going to be the voters fault. It's going to be the fault of politicians who forgot that their job is to actually persuade people think uh, of things by offering them stuff. I did see, to, to the Biden campaign's credit, I did see an ad recently on TV, a national TV ad, that was just, it was like those um, uh, trial lawyer ads, you know, you know, were you exposed to asbestos, you might be able to be entitled to a settlement mm -hmm. of $100,000. It was like that. Uh, and it was just dollar figures. It was just straight dollar figures. I said, you know, if you uh, are uh, make 
uh, if, if you know, if, you, if you're a wage employee, you might get up to seventeen thousand dollars a year. If you're mm. a senior citizen on Social Security, you might get three thousand dollars more a year under Joe Biden. And we're going to make the rich, and we're going to make the corporations pay for it. That was it. Just straight mm. vote yourself some money, and it was the the best Democrat ad I've seen maybe in my whole life. That sounds good. It was a good ad. I mean, it's better than all the bio ads. I mean, the real answer to all of this is Joe Biden thinks he can win just by showing up, which might be true. Which might be true. I mean, that, uh, Trump, Trump is imploding. I kind of think it's the case. Look, so then it becomes a lose-lose for the left. We have not protected any of our interests, any of our branding, any of our rhetoric. Biden wins anyway. We are in a weaker position than we were before the election to actually advance our interests and, sh and, sh and prove ourselves as distinct and better than the Democratic Party agenda. Democrats now believe that they can win without us because even though the overwhelming majority of Bernie's voters are going to pull the lever for Biden, they are going to pretend that any resistance, they're going to point to me and say, you guys didn't vote for Biden anyway, so we don't have to listen to a word you have to say. Any activist efforts are going to be completely undermined as a consequence. If Biden can win without us, that's even more reason to start to or to continue to do the work of activism, which includes saying things which frankly reflect poorly on Joe Biden. But we're not allowed to do that. We're supposed to sit down and completely neuter our movement. Biden literally, he won't stop tweeting healthcare as a human right. I didn't ask him to tweet healthcare as a human right. If you wanted me to shut up, all that Biden would have to do was stop lying about himself. If he said, hey, I'm a milk toast neoliberal, but I'm gonna give you a $15 minimum wage and lower the social security age to 60, I'd be like, yep. He's going to do that. And if you want those things, you should vote for him. And that makes sense. <laughs> but no, he just can't leave well enough alone. And somehow it's it's like he's coming to my house and like kicking my dog. And then everyone's mad at me for bringing up the fact that Joe Biden's abusing my dog. Like hmm. ah, there's, a, there's a limit to how much I think people can be expected to take, especially when it has implications from, for the movement in the long term. Absolutely. Anyway, I think we have to do a pop culture episode like 100% soon because we've been in the electoral muck and it's been kind of heavy. I want to do an episode where we talk about the Matrix movies with Slavoj Zizek. <laughs> it would rock. It would be so much fun. We could watch. We could have it on in the background as we do the episode and it'll just kind of talk about each scene. Like we did with the Kardashians earlier on yeah it would it would be so much fun so you have no idea so i rewatched all of the matrix movies well i hadn't actually seen any but the first one um but i re i watched all three earlier in covid times i really wish i had kept a running list of all of the movies i've watched during covid because at this point it's <laughs> it's like it's enough to fill the alexandria library right <laughs> like and I think it really paints a portrait of my kind of mental state over the course of this period. They run out of honestly. I mean, the, it's interesting that you say that the first one wasn't the one you watched. You know, it is the best one. It's it's a self contained. Film. No, no, the first one was the only one I had watched until oh, the only oh until earlier, okay okay, okay until yeah, COVID. that makes more sense yeah right right and I mean the second one is good I think the third one though it's like. It's not that they ran out of ideas. It's just that there were so many directions they could have gone in. And they were just like, fuck it, pick one. It wasn't great. It wasn't great. Also, it was not great. in terms of post-apocalyptic, uh, like dystopian type future movies, I recently watched the new Total Recall, and it is devoid of all the charm of the old Total Recall. And I told you when I was watching the old Total Recall, I was like trying to live text you thoughts and feelings. It's prime for commentary. I think we could do an, a, to a whole episode about like movies that are about resource wars and why capitalism is bad that are very, very popular. And yet- People eat that crap up. Uh, but it's popular among people who have like actually no personal politics that reflect the politics of the film. I think that's really fascinating. All these popular blockbusters that are like extractive politics are, are terrible and capitalism is horrible. And then everybody just hops in their SUV and goes home and votes for Joe Biden. Sorry. We should wrap it up. Do you, did you figure out how we should cl start closing the episodes? No, I was thinking more about taglines for getting into it. Like, I don't know. Like this, we play like goodbye music and talk about all the things we did or, um, or I don't know. I feel like we just need like a catchphrase. All I've got is like Looney Tune taglines running through my head for some reason. Like Porky Pig. <laughs> There's something like that. <gasps> Keep up the good fight. That sounds terrible. I mean, I do like the idea of doing something supportive and 
How about stay cool?